Well, this is from a website called Novel Investor. I thought they did a really good job of putting this history kind of together for us. This is something that I had known about, and um, I remember actually learning about it in college. Uh, I think it was an undergrad. It might have been a master's, but one, one of my economics classes, and I know we did some behavior economics and uh, behavioral economics, and we, they talked about the largest short squeeze, the biggest short squeeze of the last century. Now, of course, with all the GameStop you know, um, news going on, this is a, a hot topic, but I, I kind of wanted to bring this story to the public in case you didn't know about it. I think a lot of people don't know about it. I've mentioned it a few times in my Discord, um, and you can join our Discord through Patreon if you're interested. It's a new month, so it's a good time to join right now, but, uh, but anyway... So I wanted to bring this to your attention just so you can have an idea, you know, that short squeezes have been around for quite a while. It's not something that's, that's new. In fact, it's been around even before, you know, before the stock market was even around back when we used to trade grain and not stocks and, you know, before there was a formal exchange. So, but this, this story today is about the, it's basically late, late 1800s and it's about Union Pacific Railroad. So I'm going to go through some of this. I won't read it word for word, but I want to read some of it because I think it paints a good picture. So an epic stock market battle took place in, in 1901. Two heavyweights fought for control of a railroad, cornered the market, and forced the biggest short squeeze of the last century. And when you see these numbers, you'll see that it's a, it's a pretty epic short squeeze. So Union Pacific was a railroad nobody wanted to touch and not even J.P. Morgan. So this is going back to 1898. This is over 120 years ago. You know, it was in bankruptcy. It, uh, it had, some, had a lot of issues going on. So, but anyway, so Edward Henry Harriman saw this as an opportunity. He thought of syndicate backers, the Vanderbilts, the Rockefellers, all the, you know, all the big money. Harriman took control of the road, and in total, they paid. So this, this conglomerate of rich folks kind of led by Harriman, they took control of the railroad and paid $75 million, and it included 1,800 miles of railroad. They got every, every uh, penny back in their profits within three years. Now, these days, people want their profits back you know, in five minutes, but, <laughs> but usually, usually if you're investing, it does take uh, you know, years to really formulate a story and to get the, the kind of returns you're looking for. Um, so anyway, that's probably for another video. So Harriman recognized the expansion through acquisition was the most efficient way to lower costs and ensure profitability for Union Pacific. He quickly bought up competing railroads until Union Pacific dominated the U.S. west of Omaha. <laughs> so, I mean, this is pretty crazy buying all the competitors out, right? Um, Harriman needed to expand east, so he set his sights on a key acquisition. Chicago was a railroad hub, hub of the country. Anyone moving people or products by rail from east to west or vice versa had to go through Chicago. That was the main hub. The Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad was a critical piece in controlling that movement. Buying the Burlington Railroad would make Union Pacific the strongest railroad in the country. So these guys knew what they, they were doing. James Hill had similar ideas, so Hill... With the backing of J.P. Morgan this time, controlled the Northern Pacific Railroad. And you've heard of these railroads, I'm sure, before. The Northern Pacific did a great deal of business moving cotton from south to Seattle to be shipped off to the Asian markets. Acquiring the Burlington Railroad would make the Northern Pacific the dominant railroad in the country. So we got, we got some chess playing here. Charles Perkin was president of Burlington Railroad and was closing in on retirement. A sale was imminent. So the first battle of Harriman and Hill was fought over the Burlington. Harriman bid first. Perkins set the going rate for Burlington at $200 a share in cash. Harriman countered 150 share in cash plus or 200 a share in Union Pacific bonds. Perkins turned them down. Harriman began buying Burlington stock in the open markets. <laughs> At the same time, Hill proposed a Burlington merger with Northern Pacific. At the same time, Hill proposed a Burlington merger with Northern Pacific and was told the price and began buying shares in the open market. Eventually, Perkins chose Hill over Harriman. The backing of Morgan helped, but Perkins believed Hill offered a better, better home for Burlington. So there was this delicate balance of power in the rail, railway world. The acquisition of Burlington by Hill would smash and give the dominant influence 
you know, this goes on and on about the history. So Hill and Morgan never fully controlled the Northern Pacific. Collectively, they held about 23% interest in the company. They believed that nobody would attempt to seize control of a $155 million railroad through the market. And it's important to understand the mood at this time. So back in the late 1800s, ordinary investors had recently been worked into a frenzy as U.S. steel shares were promoted and railroad stocks were rising fast on various rumors of insider accumulations and mergers. So he recounts here a raging public speculation in stocks. Again, a raging public speculation in stocks. And this other guy, Clues, talks about a restless sea of reckless stock speculation that swept the American people into its vortex with all its razzle-dazzle extravagance. So these two quotes, again, this is the time frame we're talking about here. Raging public speculation in stocks. Some people might argue we're having that right now. Restless sea of reckless stock speculation that swept the American people into its vortex with all its razzle-dazzle extravagance. In this hyped environment, Harriman's attempt to retaliate against Morgan for grabbing the Burlington acted like a spark igniting a pool of gasoline. The resulting jump in prices then panic causes intense excitement, demoralization, and confusion that convulsed the stock market in a way that alarmed moneylenders, destroyed confidence, and caused a general rush to sell stocks, which brought them down with a crash involving many thousand people to have significant losses. From May to April of 1901, Harriman quietly bought a majority of Northern Pacific preferred and $37 million in common stocks, $80 million in total. He was 40,000 common shares short of majority control. He's trying to get that majority control. Hill, suspecting something was up, confronted Schiff in, the, uh, in this Kuhn uh, office, who admitted everything. Hill was furious. But he had a problem. He needed Morgan's approval before he could fend off Harriman. But Morgan was vacationing in France. A telegram was sent. You know, I couldn't text back then. Yeah, telegram. So meanwhile, Harriman placed the order for the final 40,000 shares of Northern Pacific. He needed that to have the majority control to be bought on May 4th, a Saturday trading session. Okay. Only the order was never filled. A junior partner basically bungled it and... Schiff also found out, but also ignored it. Interesting. Morgan's telegram reply finally reached Hill in the evening of Sunday, May 5th. On Monday, May 6th, the mad scramble began. Hill and his backers quickly bought up 200,000 shares in Northern Pacific that day. Its stock price rose from $110 to 130 in the buying spree. Later that day, Harriman found out that his 40,000 share order never went through, and neither side had a majority. Feeling the price was unwarranted, traders began shorting Northern Pacific stock. When you short a stock, you're betting that its price will fall. To profit, you need to borrow shares, sell them at market price, then buy the shares back at a lower price. With the shares back in your possession, you return the borrowed shares to the lender. The borrowing is done for a fee, of course, so your profit is the difference between the money you collected when you sold the borrowed shares and the money you paid to buy those shares back plus the cost to borrow. That's exactly how shorting works still today. Short selling is a simple process that can go horribly wrong because with the stock market, anything can happen in the short run. You, you, know, you might know a stock is going to go down, but you don't know exactly when and you can get in a lot of trouble. It's really gambling trying to guess when it could happen. Losses are limited only by, high, by how high a stock's price can go. You need to keep enough money in your account to cover losses. Your broker will demand it or you'll get something that's called a margin call if you're doing this on margin. And the, as the Northern Pacific short sellers found out, the price can quickly move against you and the shares may not be available when you want to buy them. That's something else that we've been seeing here. So they're limiting shares on things like Robinhood, et cetera. On Tuesday, May 7th, Northern Pacific shares were bid up to $150. Short uh, sellers in the stock started feeling the pressure. They could dump other holdings to cover their losses, or they could close their short positions at a big loss. Same exact thing that's going on here in the last few days with GameStop, AMC, and others. By Wednesday afternoon, the decision was made for them. The market was off by 20 points, yet Northern Pacific stock rose to $200. The squeeze was on. That night, brokers crowded in the Waldorf Hotel and filled the air with tobacco smoke and rumor. Broker Bernard Barrick observed the scene. One look inside the Waldorf that night was enough to bring home the truth 
about how little we differ from animals after all. From a palace, the Waldorf had been transformed into a den of frightened men at bay. Unbeknownst to Harriman, Hill's season of shares for control the day before, yet neither party was willing to sell. It became obvious on Thursday that more shares were sold short than could be bought back in the market. Northern Pacific rose quickly as short sellers rushed frantically to cover their positions, except no shares were available. Harriman and Hill had cornered the market, literally. The stock price was bid up $300, $500, $800, and finally $1,000 a share. I mean, you're talking about 120 some years, you know, years ago, and you're talking about $1,000 a share. That's a lot of money back then, and that is a huge short squeeze. The deadline, you can see, you can see the orders here on your screen. The deadline to deliver short shares was 2.15 p.m. On Thursday, short sellers dumped everything as their Northern Pacific losses grew. It set off a market-wide panic. This can happen. Margin loan rates spiked to 60%. Ouch. Compounding the selling even more. Realizing the worst, Morgan and Harriman called a truce and devised a plan. The major houses, J.P. Morgan, Kuhn, and others announced they would not force the delivery at the deadline. Listen to this. Northern Pacific sold off. The short sellers in Northern Pacific got a lucky break. What? They were allowed to close their short positions at $160 a share. They only suffered a devastating loss instead of total annihilation. What is that all about, right? But anyway, this is a crazy story. This is, you know, considered the biggest short squeeze of the last century. You know, GameStop's making a great run. It's, it's the biggest short squeeze in probably a few decades, I guess. But uh, I think this one still tops it. It's pretty epic in terms of the, the size of a short squeeze. So hopefully this was helpful. If you didn't know about this already, this Union Pacific short squeeze, you know, again, short squeezes have happened throughout history. I've got about a dozen of them I could share with you, but I want to just bring this quick one to you today. If you haven't subscribed, please do click the subscribe button, the little bell, check out Facebook, check out Patreon. It's a new month. Good time to join Patreon and our Discord team. I appreciate your time and attention. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care.